Good. Recording started. Um, Gavin, in the work session at um, 1 o'clock on um, Friday, uh, January 11th, assembly work session on property appraisal annual valuation report. We'll have Mr. Gadamus, Jack Gadamus, uh, to present. Um, I would like to just have the assembly members here uh, announce their presence, and then Ms. Winhoff has a short announcement. Mr. Peterson? Uh, Pete Peterson. Forrest Dunbar, Felix Eric Croft, Dyson, Christopher Constant, Austin <laughs> uh, Those are the assembly members present, and then we have Mr. Uh, Jack Adams, the municipal assessor, to give us a presentation. Ms. Wimhoff. Uh, yes, just a short um, reminder and announcement. I'm one of those people that's very allergic to peanuts. And so if, if you happen to pick up some of those really tasty chocolate items, if you could avoid the, the Butterfingers, the Snickers, or anything that has um, a peanut in it, an almond is okay to be around me. Mm -hmm. But I can't be around peanuts and cashews. So just thank you very much. Mr. Gadam. Okay, thank you. So welcome to the... The annual proper property appraisal evaluation. We do this on an annual basis. Again, my name is Jack Janus. I want to thank you for your time today. And if you do have any questions throughout this presentation, either feel free to just stop me through during the presentation, or you can just wait till the end for questions too. Uh, there could be a chance that I might have a slide later on addressing that particular question. So, other than that, uh, I will begin the presentation. Thank you. Is that better for everybody? So the first thing I want to talk about is really what our division does. What, what does property appraisal do? If you take a look at the bottom here, we deal with exemptions and valuation. Those are really two main things that we focus on. So if you look at the top, on a year-round basis, we administer exemptions. We work on those. Additionally, every six years, we are required by code to inspect property. And we inspect property on additionally on an annual basis. So just recently, we, uh, we just went past January 1st. January 1st is when all taxable property is assessed. Essentially, it's a more technically you could call their lien date. Um, you could call it a, a snapshot of time when that value of that property is. And then shortly after January 1st, uh, we have to mail the cards, the valuation notices, on or before January 15th. So this year we are mailing 15, and that essentially starts to kick off and start our appeal process. Jack, I asked Jack if you, you can ask questions uh, as he goes along. That's uh, fine, and if he if it's later in the slide, he'll just tell you it's later in the presentation. So it isn't. We're not answering the question. What was my property worth for most of or average of 2018? It's it's answering the question. What was it worth on January 1, 2019? Yep, it's a, that's a snapshot. So okay. technically it's called a lien date, but really it's just for simplicity, it's the snapshot. It's January 1st. That's when the house was sitting. What was the value as of that date? In, yeah, in 2018. Of, of, of this year, it's 2019. So January 1st, what was the value of your property? And that will be for this uh, valuation notice. Okay, and so if we've got earthquake damage, what happened? Uh, what will happen with the earthquake damage is I got... We're going to have a little bit of discussion, hopefully, on that okay. coming up. Um, but essentially, we um, will send out the valuation notes to that property owner, and um, they will have that window to come contact us. Well, that's the process, but I think he's asking, it's not what my million-dollar home was worth up until the earthquake. It's what my home was worth on January, January 1st. 1st. Correct. Yep. That's exactly it. Taking the earthquake yeah. Still probably. Yeah. But yeah, so January 15th, that's when the appeal process starts. That uh, by code, we have to be uh, su substantially complete on or before June 1st. And then when the appeals start to taper off, we start to get into our valuation analysis. So this is when we start to look at data going forward and looking at stuff. So for this year, we're going to be then right here looking towards tax year 2020. Uh, Finally, we also... Me. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the meeting we just had on this general subject. Did I hear you say that the appeals have to be filed within 30 days of when they receive them? Correct. He, he can't know what you heard him say. <laughs> yes. 
trying to get out of what I understood. <laughs> so the appeal deadline is, is February 14th. But then once you have the, that, once you appeal and if you preserve those rights, you appeal. We still have to work with that appeal in the process, and that has to be complete on it before June 1st. Does that make sense? And they got another slide too showing a couple of those key dates too. Yeah, so, so I just saw somewhere this morning somewhere around 85,000 people have appealed for funds for reimbursement of earthquakes. So you might be seeing thousands of appeals. Yeah, we, um, we, we anticipate that we'll see more appeals this year. What that workload is, is to be determined. So. That's total appeals, it's not those that go all the way to the board. You might be able to resolve a lot of them. Most of those, yeah, so we get a total of, there, that's another slide too. Okay, so 300, I think 57, you can check my memory when we get to that slide, to have appeals. And most of the majority, we work through that. Um, anyways, moving on. Um, with this, like I said, the last thing, the new construction we pick up at the end of the year. So Anchorage, total value of Anchorage is around $46 billion. And Anchorage, it's a little <coughs> less than 2,000 square miles, roughly. You can see the district outline in red. But most of the property is really in the blue area. It's really a small um, area. And so that's the $46 billion. But then we also have taxable value. So that's after you remove all the exemptions. And taxable value is important. Taxable uh, property tax is just a simple formula. Your taxable value times the mill rate. Uh, some of the things I find interesting, it supports more than half of the operating budget. Um, and finally, the total revenue for 2018 from property tax was about $549 million. So that included the operating budget as well as uh, schools. So I'm going to dive into a little bit more between total versus taxable value, kind of comparing the two. And you can see again, total value about $46 billion. Here's really the composition of it. A little over majority is residential, a little less than a quarter is commercial, and you have personal property. And then the two yellow slices, those are really your fully exempt property. So that's your government, uh, and then also your non-government, for example, a charitable uh, or church. Excuse me. Yes. What personal property is taxable under the municipality? Yeah, it's a good question. So mainly what it is, uh, there's really two main property types. It's either business, what, and, and that's going to be inventory. Uh, and then the other one is going to be your mobile homes. So, so they we consider inventory under a business personal property? Yes. And, okay, and then mobile homes. Okay, thanks. That's, that's the main Sorry. the main front So if you look at taxable value, the, the the, the pie changes a little bit. Again, taxable value is what the mill rate's based off of. And now you start to see that residential, uh, commercial, and personal property are the ones that are carrying the load, where residential is now majority, and um, commercial and also personal property got a little bit larger. So I'm not quite done yet with taxable value, and then we'll get into exemptions, a couple of slides on, on the exemptions. <coughs> Excuse me. Here we're just looking more at the a little bit more in detail of it, the granular level. Again, 61% residential, 31% commercial, so it's the same pie as the previous slide. A uh, couple points, single family is one that is by far the biggest as far as taxable value goes at um, roughly 16.5 billion. Uh, as far as commercial goes, industrials are fairly large, one of the larger ones in offices. Uh, I also find interesting too, hotels, uh, not 0.8 billion. So I think that's interesting. And finally, also personal property. Again, we have businesses, your biggest one at 2.6 billion. Uh, and then you have oil and gas as well. And then you also have mobile homes. And what's interesting is that mobile homes have about the same number of accounts as business stuffs, uh, but account for such a small, uh, in, in, as far as total value goes. What's interesting about the hotel point I find that interesting too, because you see these hotels and they, <laughs> I agree. She you, said what's interesting about it. Oh, I, well, what I see is that, the, to me, you drive along, you see this big hotel, it's like, oh my gosh, they gotta be worth such a big component, and really, from the sum, it, it's a relatively small with the kind of piece of the pie. So that's kind of my. Yeah. It's a work session and it's a presentation, you can go ahead and do <coughs> okay. so, 
What's the four plus unit multifamily within commercial? Yeah, so we have, uh, so four plus is going to be essentially apartments. But why is that commercial rather than residential? Because generally it's going to be, it, they behave more like a commercial where it's more of a business now, not, not like a little single family home where it's mainly your primary residence. So how is two to three units versus, I mean, maybe it doesn't matter, but it just seems a little weird that if people are living there, why is it commercial property? Yeah, so there, well, there's a couple things. So I mean, the first reason that we categorize and classify that, one of the biggest reasons is because it's in our system that we uh, have the property type. So it, it looks and, and the size of it and everything formulates better to a commercial type of property record card when we fill the form than it would be a residential. So that's one big reason. And also Brent here is going to... Brent, last night, the deputy assessor. Um, fourplexes and above, they're investment properties. People don't buy them to live in them. They buy them as a commercial enterprise. So they're commercial type properties. Yes. Um, I would just like to add, this is one context where you use commercial and residential divides, and it makes sense in this context. And there's other contexts, uh, an apartment building would be called residential because of the purpose of whatever regulation or um, program you're looking at. Thanks. A slightly different topic. And back on the hotel tax, that is, or the hotel property tax, that's exclusive of the 14% right. tax that we levy on <coughs> beds. What do we levy for oil and gas? So oil and gas is a slightly different. They are, the mill rates can be the same for oil and gas, but uh, also as the statute says that they have to be 20 mills. Let so, me rephrase my question. Okay. Who, who and what are we taxing under that category? Under oil and gas? Yeah. Yeah. The state does the oil and gas, and it's primarily going to be, most of the time it's going to be inventory, that <coughs> back to the lien date, that's been sitting in Anchorage, just destined to the North Slope or some other place. So it's like big pipelines, it could be, you know. Right, so we gather a portion that comes from the state, is that what I heard you just say? <coughs> yeah, so the state taxes, it, or the state assesses it uh, by statute, and then basically we, we get that the mill rate that we have. Does that help? Yeah, okay. I was just wondering where we gather the oil and gas tax. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. So. Okay. Jack's in charge of the meeting, so you can just raise your hand and he can do it. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So, I talked about taxable value. I just want to briefly touch on exemptions now. So, again, $46 billion is the total value. A little less than a quarter is actually exempt. So, let's take a look at what is exempt. Now, there's two main categories here. There's mandatory from the state, that's state mandated, and then we also have a local optional, so we can choose to um, include that as an exemption or not. So as far as the top one goes, this is where the value is by in the millions. Senior disabled veteran, that's the largest one at about 2.3 billion. And then the list for the other big ones are generally going to be government owned. Then. Municipality, education, federal, state. So on hospitals, it, 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 as I understand it, Providence doesn't pay because of, it's a nonprofit religious and regional does pay property taxes. Am I right? That I believe that's correct, <coughs> yes. And there is some, Providence is not fully. Um, Fully exempt. About 25% is taxable, property, roughly. Of the real estate. Of the real estate, of the all real the, property. Yes, of the value. Yeah. I was just looking through here quickly. Okay. Do you have the facts of this is the evaluation of how much revenue we get off different categories? So that's going to largely depend on the mill rate by district as well. So that, that'll be variable too. Yeah, but uh, I understand that. Much of our income from property taxes here comes from commercial and industrial, which is it pays a higher percentage. So the mill rate is the same regardless if if you're a commercial property or residential. If I go back to this slide here, again, this is the taxable value. 
So 16.5, single family were the biggest ones. And if I go back to even the one more slide, again, the taxable value by property type, this pie here is really what the middle, like who is carrying the load is really what this pie chart's showing here. So really, residential is the, the biggest um, as far as that goes. Does that help clarify that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm yes. confused about something, but I appreciate what you said. Well, feel free to either. Um, Back on that slide. <laughs> Which the, side? The, the one you just had up with the percentage of uh, revenue. That one, um, sixty-one percent this year. We last year implemented a voter-approved tax shift from residential increased exemption to property. And I just literally an hour ago got hounded by a commercial property owner said my taxes went up four percent. And so, can you tell me the difference then between last year and this year? Sixty. Uh, Here's Jerry, he's saying 62%. This is Jerry, our chief appraiser. When we changed from the 20 to the 50K, right. it was one and a half times more, right? So, it, but it changed the, because it's such a large component. It was about 62% last year, that number for us. So 1% shift down over, thank you. When we, when we did the analysis last year for the hypothetical, what would happen? I believe properties for commercial did go up right around three to four percent is what the hypothetical scenario indicated as far as the actual mill rate goes. Real world practical message, it went up four percent for at least one yeah. property owner. So that's that's really on par of what we were expecting. Thank you. Even taking into account the, the fuel gas tax. The gas tax, yes. Oh, okay. yeah. 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 And oh I'm sorry, yes, it's real. I, I think it's been done. I just want to clarify that when you show that sixty one percent that pie chart, that is the value of those properties after that fifty thousand dollar deduction. That's correct. So that's that's who's that's what the mill rate's based right. off. So that pie is really asking and trying to answer the question who's carrying the, the um, burden of, of the um, house. Okay. Yeah. If there's no other questions, I, I'll just finish this one up here too. Mr. Cheney, oh, is there a quick question? For you? Yes. Do you have a chart that shows the total amount of state exemptions? I do in a, uh, well, I got something similar. It's hidden that I didn't show up, but I can also bring that up here. If you would, after. I'd like to see it. You want because so much of what we have, state mandates we exempt them. Yes. Whether it's province well, or the spine center over at, uh, over at the lake. This one, this might answer your question though, because it says this is <coughs> these top are the mandated state. So the senior disabled veterans, this is the value of the, by the bar chart. So the to, it's every all the exemptions minus 2.2 is state mandated because we've only got 2.2 Pretty much. Two it's it's really yeah. right. Pretty much the the big one for optional is this residential that we increased last year. Which was ten percent up to twenty thousand, which is now twenty percent up to fifty thousand. So, sure, okay. this is down in the weeds. What is the state mandating we exempt the municipality? Which, uh, what, what, are, what is that exemption? What does it cover? What is it? Is it our properties? The state tells us you must exempt your municipality. You mean oh, yeah, to yeah. 50? Right? No, at the top of there, the second <coughs> bar, mandatory state. Exemption municipality. That's going to be parks. That's going to be all of our government owned, uh, municipality owned property. So the state tells us we must do that? Well, it's the concept that you can't you tax, you tax the city and you're going to raise the mill rate to take it back. So it's kind of a circular. Okay, so that's just math, but that wouldn't be a state mandate. I, I believe, uh, don't quote me on it, I can get back to you, but I believe it is a statute. Okay. That we we must exempt. That's very interesting. Thank but you. But I can I can get back to you. I can be an action item for us. To Pete, did you have sure. something? Or are you good? Okay, sure. Okay. Good job. I'm going to talk now just a little bit about uh, a couple of things of what is new, at least um, in the last couple of years. So, what's new in property appraisal? The first thing I want to talk about is an exemption review. I have a couple of slides mm -hmm. in that, and then I also want to talk about this. Uh, Computer assisted mass appraisal or CAM upgrade. I just got one slide on that. So, exemption review. So, this is the second year that we've been actually doing this review. Um, by code, we are required to review all exemptions on an annual basis, uh, but we just don't have the human capital for that. 
outcome. So at least this year with our efforts, we reviewed about 6,000 senior veteran and residential exemptions. And the results of that review of those 6,000, majority of them were not contacted or flagged for follow-up. They looked uh, decent. You mean but, you kind of drive by and see whether it fits what you think you got? Yeah, so really the process is we have all these exemptions in the office, actual tangible paper applications, and we review them. The primary thing we look at is are they getting the PFD? That's not the only indicator, but that's one of our primary indicators. And uh, if we start to look to see something fishy, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to then start to follow up and contact the taxpayer and say, or the applicant say, hey, can you help clarify um, this exemption? We see that the status um, has changed, your mailing address changed, maybe you're not um, living there anymore, for example. So if, if you're mandated by code to examine everybody every year and haven't really had the staff to do that for many years, probably. Yeah, right? correct. Sh should we change it to every two or three years to try and get it to more reflect reality? I, I would say uh, the, sh the short answer, kind of getting away from how many years should we do, but the short answer is yes. <laughs> I would, we would like to see that. Give you some kind of standard that is closer to you being able to actually do it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, something, something reasonable would be good. Fresh vision. Yeah, if I saw the previous slide accurately, the seniors and veterans, <coughs> the result, the impact of that exemption was two billion or something. Did I get oh, that far, right? for the number of exemptions or the taxable of the impact of it was about two billion. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that startles me. I don't know how else to express it, but that seems outrageous. <clears throat> yeah. And, Can you explain to me how 6,000 out of our 300,000 people getting a partial exemption comes up to 2.3 billion? No, that's no, 6,000 reviewed. Yeah, we reviewed, this is what we reviewed uh, this year. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, all right. Okay. So how many senior and veteran exemptions are there well, in total 2 billion? I believe there's about 40 some thousand, don't call me on this, residential exemptions. Seniors, Jerry might know that exact number, senior there's, veterans. There's about senior and disabled veterans, there's probably uh, in the 15,000. And then the residential, there's 49,000. And then if you're going to count all of residential, you have to count all the seniors that also have a residential. Yeah, they're on top. Yeah. So 15,000 senior or disabled vets who get a uh, 150. Right. And then one fifty thousand. Half our population. It's and and this yeah. exemption you're talking about, is that the I mean all I see is uh, on the first hundred thousand, hundred and fifty thousand you get don't have to pay taxes on or something in the house. Yeah, you get yeah, first hundred thousand. Is that is that all of that senior's exemption? One hundred fifty is the senior exemption. hundred fifty thousand. So yes. And it's not yeah. it's not half, it's fifteen thousand exemptions, right, well, out of whatever, 300,000 people. It's 150,000 <laughs> assessed valuations were given yes. for the seniors and for the veterans, but they can't claim both. So we've got some veterans that qualify both for the veterans right. and the senior. They can't qualify for both of them. They just get one of them. My question going back to veterans is, last year you sent a letter out, you had a wrong phone number on there for the veterans. I got numerous calls from veterans sorry, saying, sorry, could you get the number right? We appreciate you sending this letter out for the phone number no, to make sure it's the right number from the VA, okay? Uh, last year, my phone went off the hook. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. That's good to know, and I think that's part of this review that we're doing is we're going based off of the original application. I know, just make sure you put a number for the VA. It's the number for the VA. Oh, we put the wrong number for VA. Thank you. Might as well just put things down to the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, the veterans are not happy. Yes. Thank you, Justin. Yeah. Um, apologies if you already mentioned this, but there's no income requirement to get an exception. Like for a senior, for instance, you just have to be a senior. So presumably there are a lot of seniors that have money, but we're giving them. Yeah, we, we don't. Yeah, there's no discrimination based on the same no, yes. Pickle. Which side were you on there? 
If you guys devolve into chaos, then yeah, yeah. Uh, then we'll have to go back to it. We, Any other questions for Jack? Yeah, Mr. Peach. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Trady was saying something that I, I wasn't sure was correct. We have the $150,000 uh, uh, senior disabled veterans exemption, and then there's the personal exemption of 50000 We're allowed to stack those. Is that correct? Stack those. Right. Yes. Stack he didn't ask you, Dick. The VA, because <laughs> I dealt with it, the VA and the senior. You can only get one of those. Sure. And and the I'm not going over one o'clock. Okay. So wait, you, can stack, sorry. you can stack other ones, but just not those two? You can stack. Okay. There's, there's really only there's Erica, two. Erica, asking you, not you. Right. That's why I stopped. It, it's generally going to be what's it's typical is that you'll if it's your senior qualified for a senior, um, it's going to be the hundred fifty thousand, and then the next thing I'll apply will be the residential. So yeah, you can stack it. Okay. Well, Mr. Dunbar, I was going to ask. Uh, <laughs> so, Jack, I, I think I, I think I know the answer to this question, but I'm not sure. Okay, and I think it's the kind of similar thrust of Mr. Davidson's question as well. But you know, if you are a person of uh, your uh, low income if you are renting your uh, apartment on that, so that's when it starts to get into the code a little bit. Um, if you're living there and you're renting out part of it, you get a spatial no, 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 no. allocation. You are a renter. You don't own the building you live in. You don't own your Got apartment. It. You can only you just can't afford a down payment. You just you're a renter. No exemption. No exemption. Mr. Train, got a question for you. Let's say a couple owns a house. They're both 65. They only get one exemption, even though they're both 65. Right. They both own the property. So why do we interpret the code that way? We don't let them both qualify for an exemption. Because both of them live there, both of them own the home. We let them have one exemption. It's uh, just the applicant is on. There can only be one application per per property. Okay, so statute 2945, what? Uh, it, it states that uh, only one person can get the exemption of that property. Only one exemption will apply to a property. So if you have two seniors that aren't together, two houses, they get 300,000 for 100 But the living okay. together, they only get one. That's it. And same thing on the residence. Because you, you know, can Mr. Trainee change that, or is that state law? <laughs> Can Mr. Trainee change that, or is that state law? Thanks. Any other questions? He'd like to finish by one or by two, and I'd like him to. I like the questions, uh, but yeah, there, I'm sure there's going to be more questions with other topics coming up. But please feel free to email, follow up with any other further questions. Back to exemptions. I just want to continue on with this, this exemption review. Now, the 1,150 that we changed the status of this last year, this is really the result of that. In general, when we remove an exemption, we don't remove the exemption just going forward. We also look back to the last six years to see if they were qualified for those as well. In general, the total adjustment that happened this year was about $56 million to value. So that's people claiming an exemption that yes. they weren't entitled to. And I got a sample here. What I want to do now um, is show a, a, a sample so you really know mathematically when you say we're going back six years, really what it is. Um, but before we go, I just want to make the point that this review has really allowed us to be more equitable among the taxpayers. So here's a hypothetical, and I stress hypothetical. We reviewed an exemption on somebody or an applicant, we flagged them for further review, we contacted the applicant, we worked with them, and uh, we found out that from 2013 to 2015, they were eligible, but then from 2016 to 2018, they were not with the red no. Uh, consequently, we would adjust their tax liability, and in this hypothetical scenario, they would pay a little over $1,300. So, it's certainly important, I find, for your constituents when they have questions <laughs> about this. Ms. Wimhoff and then Ms. What would we cause someone to be not eligible suddenly if they're on the same home? If they're not eligible and they're... But what makes them not eligible oh, what happened? What, what happened between Yeah, absolutely. So you have to live in your 
house for 185 days of the year. That's what the code requires. So that's primarily going to be the reason why. So if someone was out of their house, maybe they're a, a, a snowbird and they're gone for 200 great. days, yep. then they would not. Okay, thank yep. you. Another great example that we will see too is someone lives in the home, they get their exemption, they buy a new home, rent out their existing home, and now Mr. Dunbar. Does the, does the disabled veteran's uh, exemption accrete to the widow or widower after the passing of the veteran? I don't, I can't, I don't know offhand right now if that's the case. If she's I believe, 60, I believe if she's 60 years old and, and her husband has died, I believe it moves it, as a widow um, exemption with her. If she's um, under 60, probably not. So you could have a case where a severely disabled veteran um, qualifies for this and then let's say they succumb to their wounds and they die in their early 50s now their uh, widow or widower no longer qualifies for the exemption? No. <coughs> uh, no, they, they can qualify for the exemption if there's a, if, as you say, if, they're, if the person was killed in combat or died because of wound received in combat, then the widow can receive the exemption until she remarries. Hold up, so Mr. Training, and then back to you. That's something fortunately changed about eight years ago to allow the spouses to collect that before they could. Mm -hmm. There's a problem we knew about, we changed it. Ms. Um Going back to Mr. Dunbar's question, so what if that person died because they, um, you know, they fell off a roof or something that had nothing to do with the original wounds? I believe it's the same. Killed in combat or combat related. Okay, so so if it was an accident, it may not they may not be eligible unless that the death had directly was had to do with their combat or okay. So that so there is the risk then that someone may not receive the benefits if the vet dies if it was not had nothing to do with combat. Okay. Back to you, Jack. Okay, thanks. All right, the last thing I want to talk about as far as what's in with property tax, and then I'll start to uh, gear up towards uh, the next section. Next thing that we're going to be doing, so our current, we're doing a camera upgrade project. So again, computer, uh, camera is computer system as appraisal. Um, it's what we use uh, for our program to va do valuation. Right now, our current camera system was installed in 1984 um, by what is now known as Tyler Technologies. It's reaching its end of life. Uh, and a couple of things too, it's really difficult to get support for this right now. It's based on the mainframe and it's just really hard to find uh, individuals that are uh, really qualified uh, to run some of this older uh, language. So we're doing an upgrade. Tyler Technologies will start uh, this year in April 2019. It's a joint effort between uh, our division, property appraisal, treasury, as well as IT. There's a couple of things that'll be good. It's gonna give us, again, better support that's also going to allow us for better integration. For example, our personal property section doesn't really talk with our real property section. Um, uh, talk with treasury as well. And then finally, we're going to have additional features too. So I don't want to get into the weeds by all means on this uh, sheet here, but what I do want to show that this is a sales comparison sheet that shows the subject compared to comparables. But the black screen behind is what our current system is. You can see it's just numbers. And the new system will really be beneficial for the end user as well as potentially taxpayers, where it'll show the picture of the subject, the comparables, as well as some floor plans too. So um, this is um, it's gonna be exciting. Question on that? Yes. So you, you alluded to potentially for the taxpayer. Does that mean that this will update into the website tax appraisal system so that the public can have access to these Kind of visual elements? Generally, right now, the sales comparison sheets we do print out for taxpayers. Um, I don't know what this printout would look like. That's why I kind of set the caveat right. potentially. I don't know what the end result will be. That's the intent. And so, okay, then the second and more kind of um, to the core question. So, we funded this transition last year. I think it was $7 million, right? And so, and I, when I saw that number, I thought, really, SAP. And, um, you know, fear. Up and because this is at the core of what we do, 
is how we ensure that it can operate. And so uh, have you and your teams been doing scenario planning for having two systems running, the old system and the new system, and kind of ways that we can ensure we don't fall into a very deep pit that costs us $80 million to get out of? Yeah, I, I think that the first one to, to talk about is uh, really hammer this upgrade. So our current system uh, was now known as technology, Tyro Technologies. It's an, it's an upgrade. So that doesn't mean that things are going to be easy and we're just going to press the button and go. But I think there's a big difference between this upgrade, which a lot of the infrastructure or architecture <coughs> behind the hood is going to be similar. So like our real property size, a lot of that's going to get pushed in very similarly. Uh, that's a lot different of a scenario going in to what SAP um, has with uh, PeopleSoft. So I don't think, in one sense, I don't think that they're apples to apples. But, but they're going from a mainframe to an yes. actual computer, and so a server, that's a fundamental change. It's its not insignificant by all means, I agree. Okay, I have one last comment and suggestion. Yes. It would have behooved the administration years ago to investigate failures of SAP and industries to support failures of SAP. Do some back-end work to see how these implementations are working in other communities. That's great. And we've, I've, I've been <coughs> reaching out to other jurisdictions that have been working with Tyler and their it's, you know, it's a great learning experience. Them is important, but what's more important is people that have done their system. You know, Whether they love them, hate them, or it's just okay, it's working, but find out what worked and what didn't. Yeah, we've been working on, we've been reaching base with uh, several jurisdictions already. Thank you. So, that, that's been, and it has been a great learning experience. All right, so I want to start diving into, I'm going to be again mindful of time, we've got a uh, little more than 15 minutes left. I'm going to get into markets, uh, our values essentially, new construction, and let's start kicking off what happened last year with new construction. So last year with new construction, uh, we're up about 12% compared to last year. So that's pretty, that's pretty promising. Commercial's up about 18%, but that's mainly largely due to just a few um, main big projects. So, continuing on with new construction. Tell, I don't want to jump in, but what, in what area or what projects? Were yeah, the there is the, the Alaska Airlines hangar is one of them, the mm -hmm. Oldham's Distribution Center. I always point them out in a terrible <laughs> direction. And, and a couple of hotels. Okay. So those okay. are the main ones. But looking at taxable construction, just kind of from a more historical context, uh, and you see these little bars, this is the total for, for that year. This is adjusted for inflation. Um, early 2000s, we had right around 800, 700 million, and it really tapered off for quite some time, as you can see. Um, so one of the main points of this is we really haven't seen a big construction boom um, for quite some time. And if you really look at the 80s, I'm sure you've seen that too with the number of houses built. I mean, it's massive in the 80s, of course. So, what did values do this year? Well, this is includes new construction. I'm going to take new construction out in the next slide. But in general, residential, the big number to look at is up 2.2%. Commercial is uh, also up 1.9%. And the personal property is down 24 However, personal property is largely based on last year's data. So, I want to now go to the next slide, which looks almost identical, but I'm going to take new construction out. I find this to be uh, just as important and interesting, because now we're talking existing property. Residential, on average, went up 1.7%, commercial went up not 0.8%. So, we are starting to see that appreciation uh, this year. And uh, one of the things that we do is we obviously work on data quite a bit. We look at data throughout the year. I just want to throw a couple of really interesting um, observations that we saw throughout this year. The first one, interest rates are up a little less than 1% this year. I know the feds have talked about this for so long, and now we're starting to finally see this increase. Um, we're about 4.5, 4.7 for a 30-year mortgage. So yes, it makes housing relatively more expensive, but at the same time, it's 4.7, if you look at it from a historical perspective, it's not that high. Inflation, we've been for, uh, before 2018, we've been bumping at about not 0.5% for inflation. It was really low for quite some time. We're finally starting to see that increase, um, about 2%. 
and uh, the green arrow here, which is kind of more of the positive. Um, income is up. This is state income, by the way. We don't have total firmed up numbers yet, but it's up similar to inflation. So that's uh, good to see. Um, so the three that I just talked about, at least really mainly the, uh, the two, the last two, yes, our values are up about uh, 2%, a little less than that. Um, but it's really falling in some ways where inflation and income are, are moving in the same, similar direction and in in similar magnitude. Uh, the bottom three here, in my opinion, really start to paint a picture of light at the end of the tunnel. So, yes, we're still in a recession. But we're also, uh, jobs are still declining, but we're also tapering with those. So we're declining at a declining rate. Um, one of the things I find interesting too is the consumer optimism is up about nine points from the AEDC. And finally, we're starting to also see and hear discussions about how the recession may end sometime this year. Yes, Mr. Chairman. You factored Trainer. the loss of about 2,000 people back to spares the last year, because that's reduced the demand on housing. You factor that in this too. Um, so that number, I think, recently just came out. Just I came believe. out probably yeah. So in general, I would say, no, we didn't really totally factor that, that in too much. We largely rely on, on more sales than, than anything. We just observe what people do. Yes, Mr. Dunbar? What, what would happen if the state government were to cut $1.5 billion in spending? I would, I would generally make that a, a, a negative <laughs> down arrow. <laughs> and as well as general or as detailed as I can get right now. So, but yeah, I mean, that's certainly something to consider. Yeah. Any other questions on that? I got one other kind of 2020 hindsight. Um, before I was an assessor, uh, I was largely responsible for the uh, residential valuations. And I often ask the question, why haven't homes really dropped that much during the recession? I mean, yes, we tempered values um, last year, but they didn't really drop. And I thought that the Alaska Economics Trends article here did a really good job. There's a couple of things. I'll just kind of highlight them with my laser here. Uh, first one, migration patterns. So we didn't really see a huge uh, migration outwork. Uh, controlled building. I already kind of showed you and demonstrated that we didn't really have a big, uh, big construction boom or anything. Low interest rates. Yeah, they're increasing, but again, they're still relatively um, not very high. Measured selling and buying. This one's really talking about how we didn't see a big flood of homes go on the market. And finally... What does measured mean? Measured, right here, what they're saying. I think they're just saying we didn't really see, it's been pretty steady as far as the number of homes on the market. So it's not doesn't really mean measured, it means kind of stable. stable. I think measured means a metric. Yeah. Know, it's a foot long or eight pounds, but that's not what the word measured means here. So, yes, it is. <laughs> I mean, I, I took it from this article saying that, I took it from this article saying that we just didn't see a big, huge, yeah. massive It influx. means moderate, got it, yeah. thanks. Um, and then the last one is a lot of, the, some of the job losses were, were out of state, which really wouldn't affect our real estate market. So moving on now to residential property, so I'm just going to go through the residential, commercial, uh, touch on personal property, and then um, start to wrap it up. Again, we got about 10 minutes. I want to be very mindful of your time. Uh, again, we're up about 2.2% for residential, but this includes the new construction. Um, 1.7 was the other number I said, which you take out the new construction. If you start to break it down, single family residence up about 1.9, duplex triplex up 1.7. Uh, and the vacant land, yes, we increased that uh, a little bit. Um, so when you when I say you're going to go up, you know, 1.9 percent, 1.7, um, that's the average change. But the average change doesn't really, you know, if you get a constituent that will call you, um, the average change is going to vary depending on the location um, and or what property type. And this really does show that as well too. So the first uh, one through eight here is more by geographic, so by location. And then the, uh, the more darker color highlighted is more by property type. Uh, so I'm not gonna really spend too much time on it, but the main point really is to show that there is- I have a question, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, go. What has happened to raw land that is buildable? 
what's happened to the value? Of Generally, that's gone up. So that's vacant land. Uh, oh, Generally. yeah, I'm sorry. Thank no, you. No, you're okay. Uh, I got a constituent that says it wasn't three, it was 300 that went up. 300%? <laughs> You know, a lot of times we'll, we'll look at a piece of property and we'll re-inventory it, and maybe we were incorrect before with some of our valuation. So, sure. residential data. So one of the biggest things we do with residential data uh, is we use it to value our real estate. Uh, we track listings. We track a little under 3,000 <coughs> listings for this year. The number of sales that occurred is 3,000. You see the little asterisk because... Um, this is single family home only. Uh, and then 2018, the number of sales that were disclosed to us is about 30%. Uh, we're a non-disclosure state. I'm sure you heard that before. So if you ever disclose your uh, sale price to us, we appreciate that. Uh, 2017 and uh, 2016 sales are a little bit more, largely because we get a lot of that data from the appeal period. Well, so you think those numbers will come they float back up, like you won't stay at 935? No, we'll, we'll probably, hopefully, after the appeal season, we'll, we'll get into the higher with that, yeah. Okay. So, residential ratio. So this is, again, based on some of the data from the previous screen. Uh, the first one, 92%. That's basically our, our what is our such value compared to the listings? 92 is pretty good. Um, that's right within our target. What is your target? Our target is 96%. And so here you can see average assessed value of our sales, I mean, of our, of our values to the average sale price. So yeah, that's right in our target at 96%. And then this bottom one here is just comparing the average assessed value of everything we have uh, for single family, comparing it to the MLS public statistics, and uh, that is also right in there too. MLS, I believe the public statistics, they went up about 2% to the average sale price. So we're, we're right in there. Because when constituents complain that you're overvaluing things, you're, you're at about 92 or you're at about 96? I'm so confused. 96. So the 92 is the listings. So listings generally, uh, you, sure. you list you know, a little bit higher than you sell. That's why we're a little bit lower. Okay. Does, that, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah thanks. Okay, no problem. Moving on, commercial property. I got about seven minutes before. In general, new pro uh, commercial went up about 1.9. Again, this includes new construction. Here it is by property type. Four flexes went up about 2.3. Five uh, apartments, again, the five plus went up about 1.8. Hotels, I got a slide in that. They went down this year, almost 6%. Again, here's some uh, sales data on this. So the number of sales for commercial is about 333. Uh, for, I'm sorry, from 2016 to 2018. About 30% of those, again, are disclosed to us with a 95% ratio. So here's the hotels. <coughs> so one of the big reasons why the hotels went down this year a little bit is we do it on a, we value hotels on an income approach. And an income approach really looks at stabilized income. So we look at the last three years of income. And while 2017 to 2018, the total reported gross room revenue did go up a little bit, we also lost 2015 as far as uh, a pure mathematical uh, formula on that. So uh, that's one of the reasons. Moving on to personal property. Again, personal property is comprised of many things, but mainly it's going to be your mobile home here and then business inventory, um, uh, machinery, equipment, etc. So you, you mean personal as opposed to real? not personal as opposed to commercial. I think I was confused. Okay, so it's mainly commercial, but it's not real property. Correct. So it's basically it's the it's mainly yes. Yeah. Except for mobile homes. Except for mobile it's homes. Small. Yeah, it was very small. It's very small and you'll see I got another quick slide on that. So again this is largely based on last year just to the timing of how personal property works. Returns for business don't really happen in COVID. Mm -hmm. So they take a little bit. But here it is. So this is back to your kind of discussion we just talked about. Business is the blue here. A uh, couple of things. You got the, the light blue here for business. Those are the timely. Um, if you miss the deadline, um, we'll generally will uh, 
accept the late filing and or will file on your behalf, which is an involuntary. And then again, you can see the red ties here for mobile homes are red. They're relatively small. So last slide on, on personal property. We do audits on an annual basis. And so this is looking at the uh, audit effort of this year for personal property. Um, we go back up to six years when we conduct audits. You can see a couple things here. First is, uh, this is a, you can see 2017 we went uh, down, we adjusted downward. So when we do these audits, we don't necessarily um, try to get revenue. We just try to make things correct. We are uh, trying to be equitable in that. Um, additionally, it's also a great tool to do taxpayer education so that we can really have them um, file uh, correctly and, and really work with us on that. Um, and it also just helps us so they, they know we're watching. A net adjustment uh, this year at least was about 11.1 million to tax and value. So I'm gonna take a couple more slides here. This is just now moving forward. So January 1st, again, that's our snapshot. That's our lien date. We are set the values then. The valuation cards are gonna go out January 15th. And that kicks us off in this review and appeal period. So February 14th, so January 15th, that's when we ship them. February 14th, you got the as asterisk. That's the deadline to appeal. As of January 1st, uh, the owner has the right to appeal. If you are a recent buyer, you can get permission from that owner as of January 1st. Uh, finally, uh, we do require a, a deposit. Uh, the average home, I think the deposit is $100 for the average home, but that is refundable. So, I'm gonna, uh, before we get into talking about a little bit more of the appeals, I'm going to just look at last year's appeal and just give you the numbers so we can expect. Yes. When is the, if it's, if it's a deposit, when is it not refunded? So that, it's good, a great question. Generally, majority of them are, are refunded. If they work with us and they um, withdraw it, they get their deposit back. The only time that you really don't is if you don't show up for the Board of Equalization hearing. Um, another one too is if you say, I got something wrong with my home inside, and so the issue becomes uh, relevant to inside your home, but then the owner refuses uh, uh, us to, to view that information um, where we can't verify it. So. Did that relatively small $100 fee with it coming back have a big impact on the number of cases? I mean, I heard sort of apocryphally that it, well, it sounds small, you, you had a lot of people filing and not showing up, and that cleared a lot out. I think, yeah, so there's kind of some history there. There's, that was before my time. But I think there were several things that, that changed that were different. But the biggest was that deposit. And then, yeah, that really ended up being a great, uh, a great incentive for the homeowner to really work with us. So, yeah. Either but not file it if they didn't or show up if they did file. Yeah, Mr. Train, and then if you look back in history, what we found we had all sorts of people putting in for it, but once we put this hundred dollars, it dropped in half a dramatic decrease in amount of people putting in because before you could simply call because you felt like it and they weren't showing up to the, the hearings at all. That's kind of why I asked the question. Yeah, uh, Ms. Oh, uh, just a quick question is there, a, is there a waiver process for people who can't who feel they may not be able to afford the hundred dollars? I don't believe so. Okay. Great job. Okay. Next thing. So, we anticipate, uh, we talked briefly on this. Again, it's probably one of the elephants in the room, the earthquake that we recently had. So, we've already had owners contact us. We've been working with those owners on that. Um, but the main bullet point here, too, is the appeal period, which again starts in, uh, pretty quick, is the, the appropriate time to come contact property appraisal with regarding any uh, damage to the earthquake. So, the other thing I want to mention too is that the Alaska or, or the municipal code uh, for disaster relief, the only municipal code that we have is for fire only. So, for example, if this earthquake happened um, early this year, there won't be anything we could do for adjustments until the next tax year, which would be tax year 2020. Just slow down for me. So, the, the earthquake damage that happened from uh, the earthquake we had last year will be reflected because it affects the value January 1. Yes. But if we have a big one tomorrow, yes. and it, it's 
it's not, you're not going to be able to reflect that because it doesn't reflect the value of January 1, 2019. And it's not a file. That's correct. So then, so okay. That, yeah. that begs the question then, what section of the code is that? Someone can help us find There's it. a couple of things. There's so we can look at it and then contemplate adding some certain circumstances that are rare. Yeah, that's what I was going to Given the number of aftershocks. So yeah. just, just email all of us about where that code is that says just file yep. or not. I can tell you right now, 1215-025. <laughs> is the disaster relief. And then there's also Alaska statute um, that's 25.45.230. But for either way, is it something we can change or is something state mandated? We can, can we change say it. fire and earthquake? We can change it. Okay. Yes. You, uh, you I mean, have discretion over that. Maybe flood. Keep going then. But the biggest thing here that I just want to have, uh, again, reiterate is now is the window for property owners, including properties that uh, experienced damage from the earthquake, the window is now. Did your office go look at and reassess in the last two months earthquake damage? In general, no. Uh, partly the data was just really slow to trickle out. Sure. Um, we, we actually uh, recently have discussions about this, it's actually just developing, but we are planning on contacting the uh, properties that we know of that are either yellow or red carded to just say, remind them, say, hey, please, um, if you have experienced damage, uh, contact property appraisal. And I'm so I'm, we're working on that. I, I'm not blaming you in that type too much, but doesn't it go back to, to Senator Dyson's question that if you haven't really said, we already incorporated that, we looked at it, we drove by, we made an estimate, then and the appeals process is the only way to do it, Aren't you looking at a dramatic, not just incremental increase in appeals like that? There, there certainly could be. A time, will, time will tell as far as how much that will get. Have you done any, well, wait a second, have you done anything about, and, and like, that you might double your appeals? We were looking at before, the board is already kind of understaffed. How are you going to handle it if it's two to three times, not just 10% increase? So I think. There's a couple of things to that. The first is we have to uh, be complete on or before June 1st with our appeal. So we might just have a bigger bigger workload this year that might sh get shifted into that later time period. Um, so that might be one one thing. I know we talked about the BOE and how it's really a two-month deal. It might be a three-month deal. It might be a little bit longer this year. So, so I've got a lot of people on that, but um, uh, Chris Constant and then uh, Mr. Dyson. So just to clarify, when I, I don't know if this what's the, the case here. I think that what I heard you say is the snapshot that is done today doesn't actually account for loss from the earthquake. That it, this snapshot that comes out today is, or the 1st of January yeah. is only for what was reported and already verified. And now, so... Sorry, to cut you off. Right, so then what happens is when you get a report of damage, then you make an adjustment to it. But at this point, the 1st of January, it wasn't accounting for, unless it was an extraordinary case and someone already asked you to appeal it. We, Five we, minutes over, but let's go quickly. Okay, we only had about a handful of properties that we adjusted prior to January 1st. Right. Um, a couple of reasons is, again, that data was just coming out so right. slow is one of the issues. Um, another issue was um, uh, even going driving by, you, a lot of times you can't see it. So, you know, we pro value property, we're essentially just doing it on the outside. So, there's a lot of stuff in there. All right. Um, yeah. I, yeah. Just, yeah. Um, I, had, I just wanted to let you know that I've been to some community council meetings. I know Mr. Dyson has too. And I took you at your word from this meeting where you said we really wanted people to do this now and not wait. So we have, I have been telling people if there's a concern to get in on that appeal process. Yeah. That's what I'm hearing you say. I want to clarify that we're not ready. I would prefer to, to have people contact us now than contact that's the good. Treasury when they get their tax bill and there's there isn't much to do. Okay, and that's what we I was conveying. Yes. So Gretchen's already learned how to jump in line. Just that quick. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to jump in too, Mr. Chair. You're five minutes over. You need to make a request for an extension. and You have another presentation that was scheduled from two to three, so if you could please make an extension and then tell us what it would be, I would just get me. I have one slide um, uh, Can we extend for 10 minutes? Any objection to doing that? 
So we'll go tell uh, 210 and your last slide. So this is my last slide. Great. Okay. So this is the last slide. This is just really reiterating a lot of what we just talked about. Um, the appeal period. Again, starts January 15th. Deadline is February 14th. One big question is, when's the best time to come contact us? The answer is earlier the better. You can see the first two weeks are green. Um, a lot of issues don't even can be resolved without even filing an appeal. Uh, that happens though when you come earlier. Come early, that's the biggest thing to hear. When we start to get towards the later end of the mm -hmm. um, time, you know, getting closer to Jan uh, February 14th, we're going to generally tell you to just file for an appeal. There's just no time to really address any of your concerns. Got it. Appreciate it, Mr. Dyson. Yeah, so Eric was underestimating with 40, 80 some thousand people applied for relief. Most of that's property. At least half of them got to be within the muni. And I think you're going to get 10 times as many appeals at least. And you ought to be figuring out who could you hire that's got expertise in this. Some body shop somewhere that can parachute in here and help you get through thousands more appeals. Mr. Dumba. Yeah, I was going to go on that. I, and I think Mr. Falsey is probably the best one to answer this, but I see if you were to do an emergency hire and significantly staff up, we could log that for our FEMA relief for our public assistance, right? Because we've created, we use it, we pass an emergency ordinance to create a separate flow of funds, uh, right? So that we're keeping track of everything. And this massive increase in appeals is directly attributable to the earthquake. So I think we should be able to charge it to hopefully get reimbursed by FEMA. Is that conversation you've been having with Mr. Falls? I never said that. No, I you might want to think about Ms. Wimhoff. Um, the 29th is the deadline for appealing for that um, through the state relief, and Brian Fisher last night said that, that we are at 9,600 um, people who have, have applied. So you, I think, yeah, and I think, so I do think you are Mr. Dyson's very correct. We're right up against our even extended time. Anybody else? Thank you for your presentation. Thank Sorry you. about the short time. We'll adjourn this session.